Welcome to ACX University. Today, we're at Audible Studios in Newark, New Jersey, to get a fly-on-the-wall perspective of one-on-one -on -one audiobook performance coaching. Christine Vam, who you may remember from our vocal health episode, is here to teach narration newbie Ryan Beswinnick how to approach audiobook narration. So let's meet Christine and Ryan and learn a little bit more about what they're going to cover today. Hi, I'm Christine Vam. I am an audiobook narrator, producer, director, and coach. My name is Ryan Beswinnick, and I'm a stage-trained actress. I've been doing voiceovers for the past six years, mostly commercials and some animation. The reason that I wanted to get into audiobook acting was because I heard that it was the biggest industry to get involved in, especially as a voiceover artist. And I also love characters. I was an English major, so I love to read. So it seemed like a natural next step. We've all grown up with stories our entire lives. We've been consuming stories, telling stories, listening to stories, thinking stories for our whole lives. And there's this interesting disconnect that happens the second we get behind the mic or on stage or in front of a camera, where all of a sudden we forget how to do this thing that has come so natural for our entire lives. So as a coach, I really try to reconnect people with that instinctual storytelling that has come from a millennia of humans telling stories. The strengths that I bring to audiobook performances would definitely be that I do a lot of different accents. Irish, English, um, etc. I also do different characters, and I think that I have a very soothing voice to listen to. I have done one audiobook so far, and it was a steamy romance, and I'm very much looking forward to doing lots of different types of books, um, fiction, YA, nonfiction. The way that I break down audiobook coaching for my students is completely individual to the person. I want to know about that person. I want to know what their experience level is. What are they most interested in learning? What is their 12-month, 12 12-year 12 plan for this career? And then we go day by day what they need, not what I think they should have, but what they actually need from me. I think what we're going to cover today with Ryan is whatever she brings to it. So I like to kind of take a backseat approach and let Ryan jump into the material and kind of see what happens. I'm hoping to get out of today's lessons lots of things, but chiefly I want to learn how to approach a text. Um, as a stage actress, you have to go through all of the experiences that the character is going through on stage. And I'm wondering if that's different when it comes to doing voiceovers for audiobooks in the sense of how do I mirror the emotional and physical experiences of the characters? I hope Ryan takes away confidence from this session, that she can get into the booth tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, and feel really strong as a performer and feel really confident in the booth. Now that we've gotten to know Christine and Ryan, let's head into the studio for today's lesson. I can't wait to see what we're going to learn. All right, Ryan, are you ready to get started? I am, Are yeah. you super excited? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> totally <laughs> a bit, excited. <laughs> a little bit nervous, that's okay, that's okay. So, I sent you a script called The Day of Glory by Dorothy Canfield. Yes. And the story is set in the very early 1900s. Right. I take it you prepped and you read it? I did, I, 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 yes, I read right. the whole thing. Good for you, good for you. <laughs> so, give me a little bit of your understanding of the story, just to kind of give us a little background before we, we jump in. So what's the story about in okay. a nutshell? So it is a third person narrative. Um, it's largely about uh, Janine, who is the main character. And she is um, a wife during World War I that is basically waiting for her husband to come home. And um, the scene that you know, we're gonna work through is this one moment when her husband returns, he has a 24 hour leave and he spends five hours of it um, because he has to transfer and get to her and take all of this transportation. He only has five hours to spend with her and this is the moment that they're together. Okay, wonderful. So yeah. the way I'd like to start is rather than continue to talk about the emotional journeys and what's happening with the characters beforehand, I want to see what you're going to bring to it, what your instincts are going to bring to the piece. Sure. Um, what all that prep work that you did right. is going to bring out. And then after that, we're going to go back and dissect a little bit. Okay. See maybe some of your trouble spots, what were some of your strengths, what sure. we're going to like high five and say, yeah, keep doing more of that. And mm, maybe we need to dial this back a bit. Okay. okay? That sounds good. So um, take a second. Okay. to get into the headspace that you need to get. And I'm going to shut my mouth, and when you're ready, I'm listening. Okay, sounds good. Okay. 
They clung to each other for a moment again, and gradually felt the tension of the spirit melt away in the old cure of simple bodily nearness, his cheek against hers. At the sensation, she became just a woman again. She stirred. She smiled. She told an amusing story of their queer old neighbor. She interrupted herself to say reproachfully, But I do love little Maurice. I don't love him as I love the other children, but just because of that I love him more, because I pity him so. That, he said with conviction, must be true because nobody but you would be capable of such mixed language and emotions. She had laughed at this, and remembering suddenly that she had a box of cigarettes for him, jumped up to get it. He was amazed. Where, in heaven's name, had she been able to get cigarettes in France in 1918? Ah, that was her little secret. She had her ways of doing things. She teased him for an instant, and then said she had begged it for him from an American Red Cross camion driver who had stopped there to get water for his radiator. The recollection brought to mind something painful, which she poured out before him like all the rest. Oh, but Andre, what do you think the woman in uniform sitting by him said? Of course, she couldn't have known that I understand English, but even so, she looked at me hard and she said, These heroic French women people make so much fuss about. I notice you don't see any of them turning out to run cars or distribute clothes to refugees. Much they bother themselves for France. They stay right inside their comfortable homes and do fancy work as usual. Yes, she said that. Oh, Andre, it hurt. I was ashamed that I could be so hurt, so cruel. I was ashamed that I could be hurt so cruelly by anything but the war. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. Yeah. How'd it feel? It felt pretty good. Um, I'm just starting to get a sense of the way that the characters talk and what their pacing and tonality might be like. Okay. Um, but I felt that. I felt okay about it. You felt okay. So if I said um, level 10 being, oh my God, that was the best performance of my life, and level one, oh my God, I want to bury my head in the sand, where do you think you fall? Probably like a 12. No. Um, (laughs) I would say probably about a a six. A six? Yeah. Okay. So then you feel like there's room for improvement. I do, yeah. So I want to talk about the things that were working really well for me. Okay. There were some really brilliant moments. The way that he was so excited about the possibility of America coming and the war ending was really evident in your read. So bravo with that. Um, The way that she speaks to him and he speaks to her, there was a sense of love between them. So bravo for that. Here are some of the things that I'd like to work on. Sure. Pacing. Yeah. So you and I had spoken a little bit before today about um, this being an older piece and not really wanting, and not really understanding how fast, how slow do I go. Yes. So the author here, and, and everything that I'm gonna teach is follow the leader. And the leader in this situation, and in all audiobook situations, is the author. Mm. We're going to follow their intention, right? Our job as the narrator isn't to recreate the story through our interpretation, but is to create the story in support of the author's vision. So in a story like this, where it is very wordy and descriptive, we want to take our time. Mm. Also, you've prepped this, Mm -hmm. right? You've probably read this story three four, maybe even five times, depending on how excited you were about today. So you know what's happening. Right. The audience doesn't. Mm -hmm. So pacing isn't just about the flow of the piece, but sometimes it's about allowing the listener to catch up with where we are. So we're going to really pull it back. So if your current pace was a level eight, I want to bring you back to a six. Okay. Right? Really pull back and slow down. Let's feel all the things that are happening. Let's take a second to think about where we are and what's actually happening in the story. So what time of day is it? It is like 9 p.m. 9 p.m. What has just happened? The kids have all seen Andre and then they've gone to bed. Right, and they went to bed. So right now, what's happening in this physical space, in her and his physical space? What might it look like? What might it feel like? Because it's during the war and the hours of electricity are... um, pretty much 
Do yeah, we, we don't even know if yeah. they have electricity, we don't right? Even know because if they... these are impoverished people at this point, right? She's right. been talking about not having enough money to feed all the children with simple bread in the beginning yeah. of this story. So yeah, chances are that this room is candlelit. Yeah. So it's romantic, but in a in a touch of a sad way. Right. And the kids have gone to bed. And do you think that she would want them to wake? No. No. So the two of them are probably experiencing a lot of intimacy. I haven't yeah. seen you in months kind right. of intimacy. Be quiet, the children might wake kind of intimacy. And this is just us, we're very close. She's sitting on his lap while he eats, Yeah. right? Yeah. They are so close together, so we don't need to project it all. And right. the energy is very subdued. Yeah. Okay, so what I want you to do is just take a second to close your eyes. Okay. I want you to see this beautiful kitchen that you're in. There's probably a lot of dark woods and copper pans. There's probably a fire going. There's candlelight. You haven't seen him in years and you are desperate for him to be alive. You're so incredibly excited that he's finally alive and you know it. You're desperate for his touch. It's been months. We've only got five hours together. You're feeding him. You're giving him cigarettes that you've stolen for him. There's these lovely little things. So take a second. Picture where you are. Smell it. See it. Feel it. And when you're ready, open your eyes and begin. They clung to each other for a moment again and gradually felt the tension of the spirit melt away in the old cure of simple bodily nearness. His cheek against hers. At the sensation, she became just a woman again. She stirred. She smiled. She told an amusing story of their queer old neighbor. She interrupted herself to say reproachfully, but I do love little Maurice. I don't love him as I love the other children, but just because of that, I love him more, because I pity him so. That, he said with conviction, must be true, because nobody but you would be capable of such mixed language and emotions. Okay, let's stop. Did you feel the vast difference in energy? Yes. Could you see it in your mind so much clearer? Yes. Yes, definitely. So the takeaway for that might be, instead of what can I bring to the piece, right. it might be what does the piece bring to me. Right. Right? So now let's start talking about the nuances of sounding like a man versus sounding like a woman. Okay. All right. So that's a lot of narrators have issue with this. And I yes, think- Yes, definitely a question of mine. Uh, definitely. Great. I'm, I'm happy to see it. So here's my little trick. Whenever I play a woman um, or groups of women, I try to take them up in uh, pitch just a tiny bit right. so that I can keep my men in a natural place. Mm, okay. Um, and that helps with the vocalization. But also, men and women are physically different, are they not? Totally. All right. So I'm a huge fan of use your body. Right. right? Our brains are not as smart as we give them credit for. I mean, our brains can do amazing things, but we can trick them, we can manipulate them. So use your body to manipulate your voice. Okay. Does that make any sense yeah, to like you? Yeah, broad shoulders. Yes. And, um, well, I don't, hairy chest. I... Manspread. Manspread, yes. Manspread, right? Like there is not a man I have ever seen that does not take his space. Right. Women, especially women of 1918, yeah. probably did not take their space. No, and she's also sitting on his lap. And so she's sitting, exactly. Very aware of her. So, when you are portraying them, take a second to change your body. It can be as simple as when you are her, making yourself a little smaller, and when you are him, making yourself a little bigger. Okay. And see if that helps change. Also, take her pitch just a touch up. Okay. You can add all sorts of things to her voice. She can be quiet when she speaks sort of mousy and quiet. He can be big and bold, or he can be the strong, silent type, mm. and she can be very energetic. But all of those choices have to be made, right? Right. The way we make them is you really need to understand who they are. Okay. All right, and we'll talk about that in a second. So let's, okay. um, let's grab that same section again when they're talking to each other okay. and see how maybe 
your vocal choice changes okay. based on what we've just talked about. Sure. So again, I'm going to shut up. You take a second to get where you need to get. Yep. Intimate, quiet, take your time, see it. And I'm going to ask you to do something really strange. You smile when you read. Yeah. Take the smile out for this. Okay. Even when it says that she's smiling, don't do it. Just for, you know. Okay. Giggles. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> They clung to each other for a moment again and gradually felt the tension of the spirit melt away in the old cure of simple bodily nearness, his cheek against hers. At the sensation, she became just a woman again. She stirred. She smiled. She told an amusing story of their queer old neighbor. She interrupted herself to say reproachfully, but I I do love little Maurice. I don't love him as I love the other children, but just because of that, I love him more, because I pity him so. That, he said with conviction, must be true, because nobody but you would be capable of such mixed language and emotions. All right, let's stop there. Did you feel a difference in who they were physically? Yes. Did it help you? It did help. It did. How? Because I took my time and the physicality of, of Andre just made me slow down and feel a little bit more sullen. Yeah. Yeah. So, Ryan, we're going to get nitpicky. Okay. Because you're doing so well and you thank take you. direction so well. Oh, thank you. I want to know how she feels about Maurice. Who is, let's, let's give everybody a little information. Who is Maurice? So, Maurice is, uh, I believe, the youngest and is also the child of her brother. Brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. Right. So it's, okay. Right. So it's her husband's nephew. Got it. Right. And so why is she saying that she doesn't love him as much as the other children? Because he's not one of her own children. Right. So she has trouble. So she pities him. Yeah. So right now, the read that I'm getting, what I'm interpreting as the listener, is like a very flippant, well, I don't really love him as much as the others because I pity him. Mm. Okay. But... I am going to challenge you to say that with more love. Okay. Because I would challenge that she probably does love him. Yes. Not as her own, exactly as you had worded it. It's just not as her own. And because of that, she says, maybe I love him more. Mm. Okay. Right? So we're always going to go back to what did the author say about him. And she says, I do love little Maurice. I don't love him as much as the other children, but just because of that, I love him more. Right? So mm -hmm. she has a bond and a connection with little Maurice. Right. That is very different. And she's telling else. us that, right? Okay. So I want that to come out in the read. So okay. everything goes back to what did the author say about it? Yeah. Right? They give you everything. Right. It's not like when you're in a stage play and you're kind of finding the subtext and you're finding all those little bits and you're making those choices sometimes for yourself. The beautiful thing about audiobook narration is when you get phenomenal writing like this, right. the author's done all the work for you. You really just kind of have to sit back and play. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So this time I'm not going to stop you so early on. We've talked about all of these wonderful things about pacing We've talked about setting the scene, finding that emotional place that they're both in, mm -hmm. how you feel about each other. So let's take it through again this time. Okay. And I want to listen through. The one other thing that I, I made as a note was um, toward the bottom of this paragraph, she says, Oh, Andre, it hurt. I was ashamed that I could be hurt so cruelly by anything but the war. So someone kind of hurt her feelings. Yes. So let's make sure, again, that we're paying attention to the author. Okay. You know? Let's right. support her words. Okay. So if she's saying she's feeling hurt, yeah. I want to hear the hurt. Okay. okay? Got it. Yeah. Not over the top big and huge, right? right. We're going to take it down to that smaller, that intimate space. Okay. Okay, so this time I'm not going to stop you. We're going to take it all the way through to see if all of these things are really connecting for you. Okay, sounds good. All right, I'm going to be quiet. <clears throat> they clung to each other for a moment again and gradually felt the tension of the spirit melt away in the old cure of simple bodily nearness, 
his cheek against hers. At the sensation, she became just a woman again. She stirred. She smiled. She told an amusing story of their queer old neighbor. She interrupted herself to say reproachfully, But I do love little Maurice. I don't love him as I love the other children. But just because of that, I love him more. Because I pity him so. That, he said with conviction, must be true because nobody but you would be capable of such mixed language and emotions. She had laughed at this, and remembering suddenly that she had a box of cigarettes for him, jumped up to get it. He was amazed. Where in heaven's name had she been able to get cigarettes in France in 1918? Ah, that was her little secret. She had her ways of doing things. She teased him for an instant, and then she said she had begged it for him from an American Red Cross camion driver who had stopped there to get water for his radiator. The recollection brought to mind something painful, which she poured out before him like all the rest. Oh, but, Andre, what do you think the woman in uniform sitting by him said? Of course, she couldn't have known that I understand English, but even so, she looked at me hard and she said, These heroic French women people make so much fuss about. I notice you don't see any of them turning out to run cars or distribute clothes to refugees. Much they better themselves for France. They stay right inside their comfortable homes and do fancy work as usual. Yes, she said that. Oh, Andre. It hurt. I was ashamed that I could be hurt so cruelly by anything but the war. All right, I'm going to stop you. How did that feel for you? Much better. Yeah? Yeah. I can actually see the events happening, and I feel much more in tune with the, the emotions that are in the text. Amazing. I'm yeah. so happy to hear it. So from the first read that you had to now, what was the big change? I think the big change was um, putting myself as much as possible in the story and also looking for the clues that maybe are a little bit after, you know, but you have to apply them. Exactly. In this case, though, I will say I was, there's certain words like reproachfully and painful um, that come before the quoted text. So I just have to pay attention to those and also create the setting a bit more with my voice. Good for you. Yeah. Congratulations. I learned you did a, a great ton. job. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you did. Yes. No, thank you so much. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. Good. I feel like I learned a lot. Okay. So thank I want to commend you on being so courageous to do this, you know, with the yes. experience level that you're at in front of a whole group of people. Is, right. Is takes a lot of bravery. So. Good on you. What do you Thanks mean a whole group of people? <laughs> no. Oh, you know. No, I'm all kidding. Of, I, I'm all thrilled to get, um, you know, to hear hear how to improve and the, what coaching tips you have. I well, mean, it's so helpful to me. You take direction beautifully. So that being said, um, what are some of the takeaways? What did you, like, what were the things that you were like, oh, yeah, that from this session? And LBA, it's a very small you know, we have such a short time together, but right. what was the big takeaway for you today? The big takeaway for me was definitely to make sure that I'm in the scene as much as possible to create the setting and to have that moment before that I establish, you know, what's happening before me, before I start the text. Yeah. And then also all of your notes about an, um, like high, a higher pitch for the women and, and the physicality of the men. I took all of that, and it was very helpful to differentiate. There were so many tips that oh. I learned. So, <laughs> Well, that's good. That doesn't yeah. make me sad. So do you think that, is there something specific that you think you can use ev as an everyday practice? Was there anything that we talked about that could become an everyday practice, either when you're prepping or when you get in the booth, yeah. that's going to service your performance? I think that what I can do is go back and really isolate what words determine um, how the um, character is feeling at that moment. Yeah. So like in this case, I would underline like reproachfully or um, I would underline what I discussed before that she's hurt. 
talking about something that's painful yeah. so that it preps me. Right. So a lot of times as um, at home recording narrators, um, and even um, those of us who are in the studio, the author can act as a director for you. Yeah. And if you're simply open to seeing those words like reproachfully, hurtful, later on in the text she talks about um, Andre being hopeful. And yeah. so if we take these adjectives out, the author is giving you all that direction totally. that in a stage performance the director would be giving you if you just sort of take a step back, mm. you know, and allow the author to direct you. Right. It will all make total sense. Yeah. No, I think that that's because what I do is I highlight on my iPad the text, you know, depending on the, the character. Dialogue. The dialogue, sorry. Um, and so, but now I can isolate those words exactly. too. Exactly. So that will be, that will definitely make the performance. And since you use something like I annotate, it doesn't have to be that program, but you can always write before a scene, simply jot down the emotional spot that that scene begins. Right. So this scene begins at night, it's quiet, I'm yeah. feeling excited and intimate. You can write yeah. anything down just so that you've got like a little hint before you get started on a new chapter as to where do I start. Definitely, definitely. I think that that's something I'll definitely do. I do it with animation, with my scripts, um, but it's usually this kind of long form that you can't just remember everything. Right, no you can't. So it's interesting that you bring that up. So what do you think is the difference between approaching animation work and commercial work to audiobook work now that we've kind of do Well, I think at least with animation, it's much more active. Um, I'm jumping up a lot, I'm, you know, and I have to do voices and, and and placement mm -hmm. significantly exaggerated. Maybe that's perhaps the biggest difference. Um, and then the text is much shorter. Right. So the fact that this is long form narration, I have to really, in the preparation, you know, take note of where things change. Yeah. So I would also argue that you're going to do those same things with characterizations and other kinds of genres, right? So if right. you are in the fantasy, uh, children's, YA, paranormal, you're gonna get a chance to flex those character muscles, oh, good. Okay. right? Yeah. So with, as you're saying, there are different levels of performance, right? So if animation is like a level 10, you can still do those fun, amazing characters and that placement with your, um, with your your voice and, right. and your face and all those things, that's all gonna come into play with audiobook narration. You're just gonna back it off a little bit. Right, because right? it's much subtler, it's in someone's ear. But it's so fun, it becomes real. It's yeah. uh, You had talked about learning accents. Yep. And for me, learning accents was always doing it really big and silly yeah. and then learning to back off of it. And it's the same thing here. Right. You know, as, as you move forward to like really practice things big and move back. Um, You've been directed very often in your life. Was there anything different about being directed for audiobooks that felt negative or positive, or does it kind of feel? No, I mean, for me, I love being directed because I think it's it's extremely helpful, and I'm so willing to play and try something different. Um, I think that one concern that I do have that's outside of this is that I will be most likely not having a director, mm -hmm. and so I will just have to kind of really look at what the writer's telling me. Yeah, you do have a director. Yeah. You have the author and you right. have your instincts. Yes. Don't discount them. No, you're right, it's self-directed. You're a storyteller yeah. and you've exactly. been doing it your whole life, right? When we're yeah. little, stories are told to us. Right. We tell stories as kids, Yeah. right? We create stories in our mind all the time. So don't let a disconnect happen when you get behind the mic. You are a storyteller. Yes. Just by the nature of being human. So right. allow those instincts to really shine. Trust them. Okay. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of ACX University. If you'd like to work on audiobook performance with Christine Vam, you can visit her website at vamaudio.com. That's H-V-A-M audio.com. We've also got a great performance-focused playlist here on our YouTube channel, so you can click the link in the description to see more videos on the topic. And stay tuned for even more performance coaching from ACX University. Thanks for watching.